Welcome to episode 5 of Independence podcast series. So far, we have plunged deeply into technical infrastructure related topics. But today, we're going to take a break from technical topics and delve into, wait for it, product management. Why does product management matter to technical people? That is a question of the day. So far, We've had a motley crew of uh, some of us ex-colleagues come together, Eli, Travers, and myself. And today, we, it, this is a special show because now we have another of our ex-colleagues with us today. And his name is Joe Intelmi. The interesting thing is that all of us were deeply technical, but Travers and Joe Intelmi have made this move into product management space recently. Why is that important for this show? Is because they are newly minted in the space. They have, they're going, they're living through this journey of, of making this transition. And it gives us great pleasure to have them come on the show and talk about what is so important about product management. Uh, even, even speaking for myself, you know, from the data and analytics space, data mesh is all the rage. Now, you may have different views of data mesh, but domain-driven data as a product is a very refreshing notion, and it's getting a lot of attention. So I'm just going to sit back. Joe, this is the first time you've joined this show. Can you get us started with an introduction and talk to us about product management? Hi, everybody. Sanjeev, Eli, Traverse, it's great to see you all. My name's Joe. I am an, a former Gartner analyst, like all of you. I worked at Gartner for about 11 years, covering a variety of things. I covered uh, storage, IT monitoring, and then for the last four years, I covered analytics. And recently, I made the jump over to uh, the vendor space. I work for a company called Heap now. I'm the director of influencer relations there. I'm very excited to talk with you both. It is truly an honor to be here. Um, and I think that, you know, when I was talking to Eli, one of the ideas that I suggested to him is that there's a lot of interesting thing, things happening in the space of product management, and in particular, things that technical professionals should know about product management, because many of them, after doing 10 or so years of technical uh, tasks, dealing with engineering, are wondering what the next phase is for their careers. And companies are in the same phase. Right? They've been doing, in many cases, one product, one practice. They've been delivering a line of business, but they're also trying to transition to adapt more to the changes that are occurring in the landscape. And so what I'd like to do uh, is to bring some of the insight that I've learned I, uh, in my role and in my experiences, but more importantly, to link it to the themes of these podcasts that we've been addressing. Because as you know, we've been talking about a lot of technical topics, and technical professionals don't always know the value that they can provide to the overall company, to the product, to the marketing, to the sales, the things that they know that nobody else knows. I hope that's a good intro. Thank you very yeah. much, guys. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. So, uh, Travis, um, what do you, you've been in this space yeah. for a few months now, so. Well, I think it's also, I think Joe brings up a good point. So, uh, you know, what tech professionals bring to the table, right? I mean, if you're a software engineer, if you're building products for software engineer, then you are the user of the product, right? I mean, who better to know about software engineering products than the software engineers themselves, right? Uh, so Travers, before you, before you go on, tell us what your, what your role is and who <clears throat> the company you're working for, just in case there are some yeah. listeners, viewers that don't know. Okay, so uh, for those that don't know, I do product management Oracle. Um, I uh, Oracle Cloud specifically. I have been a kind of a journeyman of sorts. So I've had a number of different career moves. Uh, I, I was about uh, 11 years as a journeyman software engineer, uh, working on a number of different language uh, frameworks and stacks, uh, then moved into consulting. I did sales engineering. I was an analyst and, uh, and now I'm a PM, uh, you know, through all that, I've also had CTO roles as well. So, um, it's, it's been an interesting journey. I've worked for companies large and small. And one of the interesting things that intrigued me about product management is just the breadth, um, that you have as a product manager. And, uh, when you have a diverse background, lots of different skills and experiences, it lends itself well to product management because, you know, one day you may have a sub one with a, with a high 
profile customer. And so you're going to be in the weeds, uh, you know, the next day you might be writing some documentation, you know, the next day you might thinking, you know, more strategically about your product. The next day you're probably working with engineering. Um, and so in, in, in all those scenarios, you are trying to build credibility, right? So you're, you're trying to get on the same page with those various stakeholders and have some level of credibility uh, with those different stakeholders. So it's a, in that sense, it's a very fun job for someone that likes to um, <clears throat> kind of, you know, have, have, you know, a very diverse and uh, broad range of things going on day to day, right. Uh, that could change rapidly. So has the product management role changed like from being less technical to more technical now? Is that what we are seeing that techn uh, technology people are making that move uh, as opposed to uh, Joe, you like to say there's a mixture of psychology and, there's a lot of creativeness that comes in the picture. I know you've been talking about it. Any thoughts on that? Thank you, Sanjeev. Sure. In my role, I interact with a lot of product managers, and I see two major trends. One is certainly increasing specialization. As companies develop more sophisticated products and try to derive their growth from their product, that's going to require PMs with different skills to be hired. So for example, the role of the growth PM exists. And these are product managers who mm. specialize in the features and the experiences that will drive explosive growth. And in the product management space, there's a term called product led growth, where your product is so good that products like Slack, for example, your users will adopt them without any salesperson involved. And behind mm. the scenes, growth PMs are architecting and designing those experiences. But there aren't just growth PMs in a PM portfolio. There's also product managers who understand mobile experiences, who understand the you know, user data and who are using data and are very data driven. There's a lot of different types of product managers. And what you'll find is it typically corresponds to the priorities of the product itself. So you asked, are product managers becoming more technical? I think the reality is that technical skills really help product managers understand their stakeholders. They're unlikely to be at the same level of skill as their best engineers, but they will understand a lot. And as we see increasing specialization, what I notice is that product managers with a broad range of experiences like Traverse are going to be more equipped to succeed because they can lean on those different um, aspects. I think I mentioned that product manager is one of the few roles in the company that's involved in the three major phases of the development of the company you know, strategy, right? They're involved in what do we build? How do we build it and how do we bring it to market? And so the what do we build and how do we build it? Those are going to be technical. How do we bring it to market? That's going to lean more on your marketing and sales and your customer understanding experience. So yes, to answer your question, Sanjeev, definitely we see technical roles that are prized, um, but it's not the only skill set you need. And in fact, product managers that are overly technical and don't want to talk to users hmm. are going to have a really bad time. You know, you'll spend six so communication weeks. Communication skills are important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll spend six weeks building a feature that nobody wants if you right. take the time to talk to a customer. So I, I have a question for both of you. So I'm a technical person. I was in an analyst role before. I've been technical all my life, very similar to Traverse's journey, except I wasn't on the developer side. But for someone who wants to make the leap from a technical analyst, from a technical professional, whatever the case is, what did you find as the hurdles? What was the most difficult part of a transition to a product manager? And, and on the flip side of that also, what did you feel like your strengths were bringing um, to, to this role? Sure, I'll go. Um, <clears throat> so I, I would say probably the most difficult challenge is just learning to um, basically make decisions based on data, right? So, uh, and, and really even even above that is asking the right questions. Uh, so one of the things Joe said earlier was, what do we build? Well, what you build is really predicated on, um, <clears throat> you know, having asking the right questions and then finding the data to answer those questions uh, because you only have so many chips on the table, right? You have to be able to prioritize. And there's this, you know, they're saying in product management about ruthless prioritization, you know, time management's huge. Um, but really understanding what you're building 
and convincing engineering that they should actually spend precious development cycles on building that thing is the biggest challenge because there are shiny things and people gravitate towards the shiny things. There are operational things. There are, you know, you could build more features. Uh, you could improve the quality of the product. I mean, there's so many directions you could go and really asking the right questions, understanding your customer and what their major pain points are. And then, and then asking the right questions and then finding that data and then convincing stakeholders is the most challenging uh, move uh, to becoming a product manager by far. So, so Travis and Joe, uh, uh, you mentioned Slack as, as one of examples of a product led uh, or a, a product with very high customer satisfaction. Uh, just trying to understand from your experiences, are there examples of products that went down the tube because they didn't follow a good experience and they started off great, but were, went astray. So are there some examples that we can learn from that come to your mind? Certainly, Sanjeev. There are some great examples. I think that the most extreme example that I'd like to bring up is, have you, do you remember the story of the Juicero? No. This was a juicer that got venture backed. It was going to be the juicer of the future. The idea is it's a virtual experience. It's a digital experience. I can take my phone and I can put the kind of juice that I want and it's going to automatically extract in the machine the juice that I need. It will print the juice like a 3D printer. Exactly. And so the future of juicing is, hey, I could be in, in the bathroom and I want some juice. I, I, I press the button and the juice arrow will work. The problem is that it had a couple of design flaws. Um, the first was that for the, you to make juice, you needed to be connected to Wi-Fi. Oh. So if you have an outage, you're going to have an impossibility of using this juicer. There's no button. It's all digital. Uh, the other problem is that the juice came in a bag that was kind of messy and difficult to use. So, you, so, I mean, who wants to use a bag of juice, frankly? Right? You're telling me an engineer designed this? <laughs> <laughs> I think that what happened in this scenario is that the product team that designed this product didn't test all of their assumptions. They were making certain assumptions. They were assuming my users are only going to want to you know, make juice when they are connected to Wi-Fi. They were assuming, I'd like to insert a messy bag into a, a, a juicer on, you know, that's in a plastic container. They were assuming that their current juicing experience is not sufficiently you know, advanced for their needs. And so this product became a media darling because a lot of folks were commenting on it. But you know, this happens all the time in the product space. Somebody invents a capability, a technology, and tries to bring it to market, but they don't test the assumptions about whether or not customers actually want this, are going to like it, and whether the downsides of this product will be deal breakers for the customer. So that's, that's an extreme example, but variations of this are happening all over the industry. You know, if you look at all of the companies that brought a product to market 20 years ago, companies that you know, required a CD install, for example, um, for, for the end, you know, patching everyone, you know, every year, those experiences obviously have needed to change and the companies that haven't been able to make those changes um, are falling behind. The reality is that today uh, your product is probably pretty bad and you don't realize it. We did a survey and we found that 95% of product managers think that their product is easy to use. And when you survey their customers, 45% of their customers think that their product is easy to use. Oh, wow. Product managers, because they're so steeped in the yeah. technology and the implementation, they forget what it was like to first use their product. Teresa Torres always says this, and she's an advisor in the discovery space. Mm -hmm. And if you forget what it's like to first use your product, you're going to have a really hard time selling that product to new users and growing. And so that's an example. I'll ask Traverse or Eli or Sanjeev if you have any others, but I hope that's helpful. I think, I mean, this is uh, fast. I mean, I, there's so many examples. <laughs> there's just so many examples of just bad products gone wrong for so many different reasons, right? The one that comes to mind for me is Friendster, right? So in the early 2000s, Friendster had a great idea, great product or a, a vision, uh, but the execution was very poor. So Friendster launches and it just pukes all over itself, right? So no one was actually thinking about 
the quality attributes of the product, right? Like availability, scalability. What if we get a jump in a, you know, a 10,000, 100,000 users in a day? Like how does the product react to that? Um, the reality is, is you can, you can go create a startup company and a product today on your favorite cloud provider and, you know, build it out and all is well and good, but it, it doesn't mean it's going to scale. Uh, and uh, so that that's an interesting one because as a, as a product manager, you have to think about not just the user experience and do you have a great product and vision there, uh, but also the quality of the system, right? Um, what is the, <clears throat> what's the business, you know, what's your go to market look like? Uh, what are, what are some of the projections there around revenue and, you know, monthly active users, daily active users, what, how are you measuring success? Uh, if you don't have that in place and you haven't prepared for it, then you're going to be in a real, you know, world of so, hurt. So I, I'm just wondering that in 2006, Hadoop came, was unleashed. And Hadoop really started this whole big data revolution because for the first time we had some technology that uh, could uh, process huge chunks of data on commodity hardware in a distributed and, and a fast manner. But then, you know, Hadoop ran into a lot of roadblocks, you know, like complexity and uh, the user experience. I wonder what's your thought of what could have been different if Hadoop had started with a combination of engineers and product managers? Would, would it have been any different, like just, hypothesizing here, what could have happened? I, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to go, Joe, but I, I'll just real quick. I mean, the Hadoop was built to solve problems for Google, right? Uh, Big table initially. and uh, initially, right? And uh, oftentimes these problems are being solved for engineers. I see this all the time in my space. We have, uh, you know, challenges internally. We can build product to solve problems for engineers to make us more operationally efficient, uh, you know, to help with things like continuous delivery or, you know, solve some problem on the back end that yeah. isn't actually customer facing. Um, but, you know, like AWS is notorious for taking internal, uh, you know, widgets and uh, trying to, you know, productizing them, right? Um, you can go down the list of, of the products that they have now. Um, and, and that's the case, right? So, um, I mean, AWS was started on that premise, Right. That, uh, you know, th this is stuff that we're building for our online bookstore. Uh, why can't we just sell this to the rest of the world? Um, so, I, you know, I think to answer your question, Sanjeev, would have been different with product managers? Absolutely. Right. Uh, oftentimes engineers are, you know, find problems to solve. Uh, they don't necessarily build it with a product mindset. Well, I mean, so that, that's, that's, that's one option. But if you look at Windows 8, for example, I mean, Microsoft had all the product managers in the world mm. and Windows 8 was probably one of the worst operating systems that they ever put out there. I mean, the idea was right. The execution was poor. They tried to bring uh, an, a, essentially a, uh, a, an iPad-like operating system to the desktop and that didn't work. If I'm not mistaken, actually, the person that was running that either got fired or quit or something like that. But that, that's a good example of a product that well, I know Sanofsky was the Windows guy, right? Sanofsky was the Windows guy. Um, but, I, I mean, it's, I, you know, why Windows 8 failed? I was thinking maybe Windows Phone. Uh, you know, that's a clear example of something that failed. But the interesting thing is, like you said, Eli, they had all the product managers in the world. If you miss little things in your, you know, whether it's engineering or go to market, those little things become very big things, um, you know, and all. I'll, I'll pivot slightly and just say with Windows Phone, they just lack the ecosystem. Uh, so they have a real strong strategy around ecosystem and their go to the market there. Travis, even the operating system on a desktop, I mean, it was it was a really bad user experience. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I think there was this idea. I, I think there was a vision uh, that fell short on execution. I right? agree. And I actually don't think the vision is necessarily a bad one, which is, hey, I need a device that kind of goes with me anywhere, right? You know, beyond, you know, more powerful than a laptop. It can do things like an iPad can, um, you know, uh, what's the, what's the example I think that was used was like toaster ovens. Uh, so Sanofsky and please correct me. We'll do a fact check on this, Eli. 
But he okay. said something like, uh, you know, he was getting railed about this. And he brought up, well, you know, somebody combined a toaster and an oven and everyone loves toaster ovens, right? So, you know, somebody combined a mobile experience in the Windows OS and everyone should love it, right? And that was the vision uh, that the execution was but so one question then to you just real quick, and I apologize, this is for both of you, Joe, you as well. So you mentioned, Travers, that you have to make these decisions based on data. So I'm going to assume that you and Microsoft at that point, you got a ton of data, right? So how do you, how do you extrapolate the right types of data? Like, is it a one person making this decision? Is it several people? Do you have a, a, a small maybe list of customers that you test this against before you decide, hey, we're going to go full blown. Like, how do you take the data and, and validate it? Can I take this? Yeah, go ahead. It's a great question, Eli. And I think the real key here, the underlying question is, how do you decide what to build? And the process to do that is something that I discussed in a webinar about a month ago with Teresa Torres. And I would just take you through the one minute synopsis of this. So the first thing you should do if you're interested in improving your product is you should go out and talk to customers about their experience of using your product or products like it. And while you're doing that, you should keep an eye out for opportunities. What might those opportunities be? They might be points of delight, things that a person is really happy and loves doing and a use case that they're enjoying or a point of pain, something that they really don't enjoy doing, a problem in their life that they need solved. And so you, you basically discover opportunities. Those often will come ideally by asking people to tell them, to tell you a story. Tell me about a time, if you're Netflix, tell me about a time that you were looking for what to watch. And you thought to yourself, you know what, I'd like to watch sports. What was that experience like? How, how did you find the sport that you wanted to watch? Then having discovered some opportunities, that's not enough. You have to go and you have to discover what solutions to those opportunities might exist. And so that might be ideation. So I spend some time brainstorming what could solve this problem? And the best way to do this, frankly, is to do it alone. Come up with like a list of seven or eight things because your first couple ideas won't be very unique, but your sixth and seventh idea will probably be pretty unique as a solution to this problem. And, you know, if you need inspiration, you can look at what your competitors are doing or what different, you know, markets are doing and try to extrapolate them. Then you want to take those solutions and you want to test the underlying assumptions that underlie those solutions. So for example, I'm Netflix, I want to start offering sports. And so what are the assumptions that people are going to want to go watch sports on Netflix, that I'm interested in the sports that Netflix has available that I want, you know, I'm going to need to be able to use this platform to search in this way. And so you'll have all of these different assumptions. And so what a lot of technical people would do is great, we've got a solution, let's build an MVP, let's build a prototype and test that prototype in the market. But that's going to take a long time. So instead, you go to your users and you ask them, tell me about the last time that you watched sports. How did you find what you wanted to watch? What were some things you experienced? Did you have this experience? Did you have, for example, a problem where the the channel you wanted to watch wasn't available? And how did that make you feel? And what makes it what you want to do? So basically, rather than testing the prototype, you test the assumptions that you're going to build the prototype to solve. And the other way you test, and this is where you get to the data, is you actually look at real user data and behavior. All right, so I mentioned the discovery side where you talk to customers. And yes, product managers should talk to customers every week, if possible. So, Joe, because they I, need I to find that out. But the I, data I, I, side is to, just one last thing, Sanjeev. Sure. The data side is to discover what can our data tell us about what our customers are doing. So, for example, my product helps you identify where points of friction are in the customer experience, where you're not converting. So for example, one of our customers discovered that they, nobody was pressing the start free trial button on their website. Mm -hmm. When you change the name of the button to pricing, people clicked it 40% more often because mm -hmm. people weren't ready to commit to start a free trial, but they were interested in the pricing. The pricing. And so you can discover that with data too. And so the reality is that it's a, it's a, it's a dual process. You have to do qualitative, and quantitative research to discover opportunities and then to test them. Mm -hmm. And testing can also be A-B testing that you start doing on your site. You build, a, you build a, a feature, you build a fake door, and you see whether people go through it and what the adoption is. And so there's a lot of different tools you can use. I, obviously, I'm biased. I come from Heat. That's a useful one. But it's only part of the process. There's a discovery phase that engineers often don't want to do this work. They just want to skip to the building part. Um, 
but that's 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 a you know that's a classic Windows 8 scenario where we build the feature, we didn't test it. Yeah, it, it reminded me of uh, Facebook or Instagram, where uh, people discovered that when you post a new message, instead of showing you the likes right away, if you wait for like two minutes, it it just amps up the people. It just creates so much anxiety and tension that then you flood them with all the likes and they're hooked. You know, so yeah. that that was a, a such a minor tweak, but it just shot up the whole concept of likes uh, like nothing else. So, so well, Joe, one of the thing, one of the things Joe said that I I think it's interesting is uh, I don't know who said this, but it was uh, it's easier to sell painkillers than vitamins. <laughs> so. It's, uh, you know, I think that's especially true in the enterprise, uh, you know, in, in um, you know, B2B type of scenarios or B2E. Uh, but yeah, painkillers over vitamins. So w- one thing I, I want to ask uh, is about asking customers what they want. Because if we look back, you know, there's some celebrated cases like Henry Ford. He said, if I had asked people what they want, they would have told me a faster horse. You know, if you look at Steve Jobs, when he yeah. came up with iPod, he couldn't ask people, do you want a handheld device that you can serve yeah. the internet? Because people would be oh, like, oh, so yeah. how do you reconcile with that? I, that's, that is that is spot on, Sanjeev. So, you know, I think Joseph talked a little bit about user testing. Uh, I think you're always going to do user testing, but upstream from that is user research. And user research in my opinion, depending on the product is an optional step, right? And and those are classic examples where, you know, Steve Jobs didn't go out and do a bunch of user research. Yeah. <laughs> like Henry right. Ford didn't go out, uh, he's, you know, I mean, you have an idea and you execute on it, right? I mean, that's part of the risk. Uh, you know, you have to you have to take that into account, right? I mean, there's, there's a certain level of risk when, uh, you know, you have some crazy idea uh, and you know people are going to love it. And... I mean, you could talk to a few people to get market validation, I guess. Um, but, you know, you're probably, you know, doing too much upfront analysis, you know, leads to analysis paralysis. Um, and, uh, you know, if you can't get your market, your product to market, somebody else is going to get your, that same product to market, right? So you may have first mover advantage, uh, but as soon as you you sacrifice that and spend so much time on user research, uh, you're going to end up in a world. Yeah. I will say user testing is important mm-hmm. because development cycles are precious. Yeah. I can't emphasize that more, enough. So be, before it goes downstream, down the pipe, mm-hmm. you want to have proper user testing so that you are spending those developer cycles on the right things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one thing, thing, quick thing. I mean, I think ahead, we also have to, we have to make a, differentiation between you know someone that is a visionary and in this case i'm not talking necessarily that steve jobs invented the ipod i think it was one of his engineers he just spotted the idea and that's kind of how they how they went through but i think the innovation part the vision type i agree that sometimes customers don't know what they want until you show it to them but that's so far and few in between right so i mean yeah. apple needed something at the time it, it, the company wasn't doing great and look at where they are all from an ipod <laughs> all yeah. of this came from the ipod yeah i want to challenge a comment that was made which is this idea that steve jobs didn't do user research and this idea that you know henry ford said you know he did absolutely say that and you know apple is known for not having done that type of research but the reality is at apple there were a lot of people talking to customers yeah. and understanding what their needs were and I think that it's very important to not get caught up on that idea of customers won't tell me the truth about what they need. In many cases, the onus is on the product management trio. And this is usually the combination of the product manager, the engineer, and the designer to all get together and interview their customers yeah. and to measure, you know, what and to he- look at what they're hearing from the perspective of not asking them, what is it that you need? Asking them about their lives asking them about, about their experiences, asking them, because humans are notoriously bad at telling you what they actually want. 
but they're Ooh. great at telling you stories. And so from those stories, you can learn a lot about what the opportunity is. We have to think in terms of stories, not in terms of features. And what did, what did Apple do? Apple brought beautiful design, delightful experiences, and they brought more to the user than just technology, right? Apple isn't yeah. a technology yeah. brand. It's, it's a, it's a Veblen brand. good. Apple's a Veblen good. Exactly. They can charge however much they want for a laptop and people will still buy it. It's a statement. Yes. Well, and it's I, I think by a beautiful that, ecosystem, right? Yes. Incredible device interoperability, which yeah. you mentioned that ecosystem point before. It's really important. Product-led growth is becoming community-led growth. Hmm. where you don't just try to sell products that sell themselves. You try yeah. to create an experience of other users who are actively recommending the product to each other and making the experience better. All across the board, we see tech companies and banks buying media companies, buying community companies. And why are they doing this? Because they realize that the future is not just creating a beautiful product. It's creating the end-to-end -end set of experiences where I go somewhere and I'm surrounded by friends who are so also using my I love that. I love that, that what you just said, this product-led growth is transforming into community-led growth because this is exactly what I see uh, that's missing in the market today. Because when I talk to startups, these startups are so focused on adding more and more bells and whistles to the product. But the problem is that they are having this this uh, crisis, which Jeffrey Moore wrote in crossing the chasm, going from early innovators to early majority. And the reason is because they don't have a community that is advertising for them. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is why, you know, open source is successful, maybe not as a business, but at least mm -hmm. as a community. Right. Yeah. Um, but before I before I jump into that, let me just say that, you know, back to Joe's point, 100 percent. You need to talk to customers, users, you know, every day as possible, and you need a feedback loop, but you also need not be afraid to fail, right? So I think it's Reed Hoffman that said, if you're not embarrassed of V1 of your product, your MVP, right, your minimum viable product, uh, then you've done something wrong. And uh, getting stuff out to market is just as critical. And yeah. sometimes users don't know exactly what they want to Joe's point. And they need to see a vision uh, to really understand what that is. And then you can iterate on that. Great point. This has been an amazing conversation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, any parting words for uh, our audience, like people who are watching this and they are considering going into, into product management? What would you, both of you want to tell them? What I'll give you my two minute summary. Yeah, go for it. So the best way to become a product manager is mm -hmm. to build a product in mm -hmm. your spare time. You don't need to know how to code because yeah. there's codeless tools now that you can use for design, for prototyping, for deployment, for production. You do need to learn the experience of what it's like to talk to customers, come up with an opportunity, build a solution, and create a minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. Hiring managers are looking for builders because that's what product managers ultimately do, right? They decide what to build, how to build it, and how to bring it to market. The second best way to become a product manager is to start actively helping the product managers in your company where you work right now because they have needs. Product managers are notoriously busy. If you ask a product manager how their day is, they'll say it's like 80% meetings and meetings with everybody. They need help. They're looking for smart people to help them. And so you can make up horizontal move into product management in your company. And product managers are not always for software companies. I think it's important to highlight that That's in right. any company, there could be product managers. So for those watching or listening, don't think that this is, if you're not working for a .com, that there are no product managers. I think that's important to highlight. Yeah, even end user companies, even banks need product oh, yeah. managers. Yeah. Yeah. Any company with customers needs a product manager. So Although not all of them yeah, have. And I, th I think what we were talking about primarily here is digital products, uh, but there's yeah. obviously physical goods and other types of products, um, which I have no experience with. I only have experience with digital products. <laughs> and the third thing that you should do if you want to become a product manager yeah. is you should definitely tap into the community. There's many product managers who are actively trying to create templates, trainings, 
And are there certification we, programs or training out there sure. for product managers? Sure, there's a lot. There's Reforge is a well-known one. There's another one called On Deck. There's another one called Product School. Uh, there's another one called Product Teacher. Honestly, so if you we'll link product, all of those in the description, Joe, sure, you send yeah, me those. We'll put them for, the, for our listeners in the description. Product and, and, faculty, and, yeah, and, and so yeah, there's a lot. But definitely, there's a great community. And you've been a big fan of uh, some design tools, right? Which have pretty much transformed how we design. Do you want to talk to to us about sure. what's your favorite? <laughs> so it's I uh, typically try not to get too tool aligned in, in my podcast. But I, what I will say is this. Um, there is a beautiful suite of tools that are available for aspiring product managers to learn. So, for example, if you want to learn design, Canva is a great place where you can design templates um, for your product. Uh, and that's, you know, another Apple uh, alumni, Guy Kawasaki, who does Canva, right? Um, prototyping, Figma is a great tool, you know, A-B testing, you know, there's a lot of tools out there. And what I would say is this is, uh, I'll, I'll, what I can do is I can link you to some accounts of, of product managers who will show you what stack they use for open source product development so that you as a user can um, access it. So for example, Andrew Bowker um, posted about how he built a product using absolutely no code, even though he's a, you know, he works at IBM. And I agree that, you know, and I, I guess I will take the opportunity to say that I jumped from Gartner to Heap because I saw an opportunity in this space to answer a question that we asked earlier, which is how do we use analytics to make better experiences, great, better digital experiences as all of our experiences become digital. Um, however, I wouldn't say that it's the only product out there. There's a lot of great products that you can use. And I think the key to understand is there's a whole tool chain that's available now for product managers that wasn't available before. You know, in the old days, you needed to have access and connections. Now it's just a couple of clicks and you can build an entire software stack um, to optimize it. But yeah, I'd love to hear what Traverse has to say to those two questions as well. Well, what I would say is that, uh, number one, um, learn to speak in bullet points, 100%. <laughs> number two uh you have to differentiate between what a product manager is and a project manager and a product owner and a program manager um or sometimes called a technical program manager uh, so many companies have uh roles that they kind of sound the same and a project manager is an entirely different track right so you see people with like pmp certification uh, you know, it's all about execution, right? It's Gantt charts and, uh, you know, Kanban or scrum boards and those kinds of things. Um, product management is different than that. And you're thinking more strategically about the product, definitely more on the user experience. Uh, certainly execution is important, but you're also thinking about things like go to market. Um, a TPM, technical program manager, which is very common in all the different FANG companies, is going to be heavily focused on that execution aspect. And oftentimes you're working really closely as a product manager with a TPM. You're also working with engineers and, uh, and obviously customers and, and different stakeholders, whether that's in pricing or finance or compliance. Um, so really understand what you're getting yourself into. If you are interested in chaos and um, ambiguity, uh, then product management is probably a good role for you if you thrive in that kind of environment. Uh, if you don't, and it's not a it's not a bad or good thing, uh, then something like TPM may be a better role for you, right? Where it's like, hey, here's the here's a list of things that need to get done. Here's the you know timeline, so let's execute. Um, uh, and and there's there's other roles uh, out there as well. Uh, so that's why I would say number two, um, and uh, you know no, number th number three, I would just say. Um, understand what kind of product you're getting into. Uh, so the startup world is going to be much different than like an enterprise software company, right? Um, uh, you know, to your point on Windows 8, I mean, how many, you know, dozens or maybe 100 product managers they probably had on that product, right? Each responsible for various different features. Well, all those things have to interact together. Uh, if you go to a startup as a product manager, you've got a product, um, you know, or, you know, maybe if, if depending on the maturity, you might have a product line, uh, but it's going to be a much smaller um, surface area that you're going to be responsible for. And so just kind of understand what you're getting into, you know, is it an existing product? Am I trying to bring new features to market on top of that product or enhance that product? Um, 
and uh, you know that's that's definitely key. That would be my, my number three. Oh wow! So uh, I thought that crossed my mind was when you said uh, bullet points are your friend or something like that. Uh, it reminded me uh, Joe and I follow uh, this visionary who writes amazing thought leadership pieces. His name is Ben Stencil. He created Mode Analytics. He just went on a long blog rant against bullet points, saying that they just suck the life out of like everything you're trying to do. So it's interesting to hear you say bullet points are your friends. Well, I mean, I it's, just, it's, just commu- it's just communication. Right? Right. I would just call that communication skills, right? Yeah, yeah, brevity. I think Travis was highlighting brevity and get to the point instead of you know, monologues. But so I want to I want to squeeze in one last quick question and just give me one answer to it, basically. Do you recommend a product management position to anyone that's looking? Is it a rewarding job? Do you do you still like the choice that you've made going from essentially analyst to the product manager? I, I would say you have to be uh, very um, uh, tolerant of delayed gratification. So you are going to do things today that don't have an impact for months, uh, maybe a year. And, uh, you know, you're planning out roadmaps that are years in advance sometimes. And so you may not. Are you enjoying it? Are you Travers enjoying it? Oh, I love it. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, but that's, that's because like I grew up in chaos. So I enjoy, uh, you know, that type of environment and I enjoy variety in things. Uh, So I don't necessarily like to be focused on just one thing day to day. I like a variety of things. So for me, it's great. Joe? I will admit that I am not a product manager, right? I am an influencer relations specialist. I more do like analyst influencer relations. But I talk to many product managers and I talk to the influencers in our space. And one thing I'll find that I, I noticed that's unique about this space is the number of people who have a crazy job as a product manager. And then at night, they keep reading about product management, go to events about product management, read books. They're obsessed with product management because it's, it's hooked them. Basically they create addictive products and they become addicted to the product that is changing people's lives. And that's what ultimately product managers do. They create the products that change the way we live as humans. And that is a beautiful vision that many people are looking for. It does take significant commitment and sacrifice, though, just like technologists have had to sacrifice in their career. And it's an opportunity for technologists to gain a whole new skill set of leadership, communication, influencing without authority, being comfortable in ambiguity, as Traverse said. And so I recommend it thoroughly if you have that interest and desire in a job that you might get obsessed with. And, and you don't have to be an old crafty guy like me to become a product manager. You can go to school to be a product manager, right? And I, I know PMs that are way better than me that just they went to school to be product managers, right? Oh, wow. um, so, I mean, there's so many different career paths for product managers, uh, you know, you, you, coming from, you know, analytics or software engineering or infrastructure or straight out of school, or if you have a business background, that's su- super critical as well, right? It's also a great path to becoming a founder, if that's a path that interests you. Yeah. Starting out as a product manager and then becoming a founder. A lot yeah, of you have that much started out as a PM. That's a very good point. Excellent yeah. point. Yeah. Great point. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to have uh, have all of us talk about product management. It's a topic that we don't generally talk about, but but uh, thanks for raising the profile of this such an important topic. So with that. We'll end the show here today. And- we could keep going. I think I could talk about this all day long. I, I still have like a list of things in my backlog in my brain yes. uh, to, to we, talk about. We so. will have many, many more episodes on this topic. This is just a big name. Thank uh, you guys for having me. It's been a really pleasure. Thank you so for much. coming on the show, both of you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you.